Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to Ed Up on the Ed Up Experience Podcast, where we make education your business. Today, my friends, is a day of firsts. It's a day of firsts for a few reasons. Well, we think we might be the first higher ed podcast to pass 100,000 downloads. That's going to happen here pretty soon, which we can't believe still that people listen. Over the last three days, as this episode comes out, the three days previous to this, because dates don't matter in podcasting, we had over 1,300 listens of our episodes, um, which is exciting because we're bringing in community colleges and private colleges and thought leaders and diversity, equity, and inclusion voices and just people from everywhere, membership organizations, and hint, hint, um, we, we've got two, again, back to the, the whole theme of first, we have a previous guest who has come back to co-host with me for the first time no pressure for her i'm gonna she 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 was wondering how i'll introduce her but i'm gonna say that she's absolute fire what did you say fire fire it keeps going like that until i stop it here she is she's the future doctor naya blair hackworth and she's director of inclusion at the ncaa naya what's going on good to be here on the other side of the things fire you like my fire button fire. i like the fire. Just keeps fire i don't know how to turn it off now I, I keep going <laughs> how are you how are things i'm well things are great um we really enjoy participating and being on the podcast and really excited about our guests today just to be here well, with you i appreciate you naya one thing you said and you kind of gave me a cool testimonial when when we were done with your with your edup experience you said you're leaving with a big smile on your face because you were nervous and then you left <laughs> because it was so much fun and i said well that's what we want to do here yeah is that was that true or were you just trying to boost my no ego? it is i have a big smile on my face even now so it's great <laughs> Great experience. Well, I'm glad that you're here because I think you're going to add such a needed uh, angle to our questions for our guest today, who um, you know her. If you follow higher education, you know her, you've seen her, you've talked to her, you've followed her work. She's writing books. She's leading organizations. Here she is, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, the applause, <laughs> Dr. Marjorie Haas. Oh, no, my screen turned off. How do you like that? And, and uh, Marjorie, I'm going to have to reintroduce you. Hold on a second. This is this is the good thing about podcasting is is you can redo it. Hold on a second. Right when I'm introducing you, my whole screen goes black. Okay, oh, here no. we go. Okay, I'm gonna try that again. And here she is, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Marjorie Haas, president at the Council of Independent Colleges. Marjorie, what's happening? How are you? Hey, it's great to be here. I appreciate that warm that warm round of applause that you. Did you know that the and, crowd was gonna uh, go wild Naya, for you? seem to be able to make possible for me. Yeah, so you didn't know you. that the crowd was going to go wild for you? No, that was, that was, um, that was an exciting surprise. I, I want, I got to tell you, Marjorie, because, you know, Naya came on and she says, you know, I, I want to make decisions. It's my first podcasting co-hosting, um, uh, you know, foray into podcasting. I'd like to make some decisions. So she programmed this, uh, a sound effect for me to introduce you, which I of course did not use. And here it is. I was supposed to say, Dr. Marjorie Haas, no, that is not true. And I that was like, are true. you serious, Naya? True. Like, come on, we got to go bigger than that. No, all about the empowerment. No. <laughs> uh, well, Naya Mar and I share that interest. So we're, we're, we're going to outvote you on that. I think. Yeah. No. Well, you guys have a connection, which I want to talk about um, and, and have you guys talk about more, more than me. But Marjorie, set the stage for us. You're the president at the Council of Independent Colleges. What is the Council of Independent Colleges? For those that don't know, what work do you guys do and how do you do it? The Council of Independent Colleges is an association of more than 650 independent colleges and universities. We are of a variety of sizes, about 20% of our members are smaller than say 1,000 or 1,500. Uh, the majority, the vast majority are in that sort of 1,500 to 3,000 student range and the remaining group are um, bigger than that. What we share is really a commitment to student-centered education, to fierce independence of our governance and our uh, missions, and a real belief in relationship-driven education and the power of relationships to help students access um, to learn to access higher education to learn and to uh complete and then go on to change the world love it so talk to me about how your uh the council 
had to shift its support services, if at all, during the last 18 months to the independent college uh, membership, how you supported, how you had to change how you supported, what was the focus of your support, um, and, and what were the needs of the independent colleges? Well, that's a lot of questions. Sorry about that. They are, but that's all right. It'll be an interesting question, set of questions for me to answer because I will be answering them really not from the perspective of the president of CIC, but from the perspective of as a president of one of our member institutions. I came to the uh, council in July, and bef immediately before that, I was president of Rhodes College in in Memphis, at Tennessee. And so I began my pandemic uh, journey as a college president and really had to work to think about how to keep our students and our community safe. So uh, we, like many of our sister institutions, transformed from being an all face-to-face -face model to doing a lot of what we did remotely, at least for a period of that. We were really fortunate to be able to rely on the resources of the Council of Independent Colleges. So the council was able to pivot very quickly to providing a web-based and other forms of remote connection for college presidents. We really relied on that. You know, it was a moment where our presidents were making decisions they had never made before. And they were making them really very much in a vacuum. As you probably are well aware, given the focus of this podcast, higher education was one of the first sectors of our society to respond vigorously and clearly and from an, in an evidence-based way to the onslaught of this pandemic, which meant that our presidents were leading not only their colleges, but their communities often as well. And so being able to speak with others going through that same experience, being able to rely on the network of institutions was really essential uh, for me personally, and I think for many of our members. Yeah, everybody needed somebody, right? And it created a lot of intersection of, of people who maybe didn't speak before who go, Hey, you're having the same problem. What do I do with this? What do I do with that? Yeah. Well, Speaking you know, our colleges are very, I mean, our college presidents tend to know each other. We, we spend, a, um, you know, time uh, working together and um, engaging it with, in organizations like the council of independent colleges. But I do think that we needed to rely on each other's levels of expertise in new ways and really trying to understand something that was very novel and new, it was really important. And, and it was, we were fortunate that we already had so many strong relationships and that we had the resources and the professionalism of the, of the council uh, to, to gather, you know, to, to rely on. So I'm here now, we just had our very first face-to-face -face meeting in uh, a long time. Right. We, I just came back uh, from our meeting. Uh, we do an annual institute for chief academic officers. We had over 600 people in attendance this year. We invited um, not campuses not only to send their deans or provosts, whoever their chief academic officer is, but also to send along a team that included chief uh, student affairs officers and chief diversity officers. So it was really exciting to be with 600 of our colleagues at a conference face to face. We were able to do it safely and, and, and in a healthy way. We required vaccination and had lots of protocols in place, but it, it was really wonderful to be back together. Refreshing, I bet, right? Yeah, and, and people needed to. They needed to get off campus. They needed to talk talk to each other and and just process what had happened and then think about what's to come. Well, speaking of people who rely on each other's expertise, I would like Naya to bring you into the episode here and take over and tell me how you and Marjorie have worked together because it's such a cool way that you guys have intersected with each other. Yes. Well, one, we intersect and she doesn't realize that at Rhodes, is just, which is in Memphis, Tennessee. I grew up in West Memphis, Arkansas, so I know all about Rhodes College. You do. So that's really, yeah, it's really you've exciting. Seen our, you've seen the Gothic architecture. You know I have all. seen it all. Um, um, but we, how we also know each other is through the NCAA on the Committee on Women's Athletics, um, where Marjorie, President Marjorie, it's so funny just seeing Marjorie, um, uh, Marjorie is good. Please feel free. 
It's good. Okay. Well, where you are a member on the NCA Committee on Women's Athletics, and this committee provides leaderships and assistance um, to the association in our efforts to provide equitable opportunities, fair treatment, and respect for all women in all aspects of intercollegiate athletics. And so um, it was great having you a part uh, of the committee when you were president of Rhodes. And so how was that experience for you? Because you really contributed a lot to us. It was um, a fat, it was it was a fascinating experience for me and really eye opening. I, I had served uh, earlier in my career when, during my first presidency, which was at Austin College in Sherman, Texas. I had served on the Division Three Management Council, so that was really my first introduction to the inner workings of the NCAA oh. and to to seeing how important that kind of leadership was. As you know, the NCAA is intended to be a presidential leadership organization. It doesn't always function that way, but it, it is intended to be that way. I need the juicy gossip. What, what other gossip? Oh, no, no. That's, we'll, that's Naya and I over a glass of wine, uh, not on a podcast. Oh, wait, but, wait, wait. Naya um, and you over a glass but, of wine. I got something for that. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, but I, I will it. tell you that uh, being a part of that management council was a great education for me, but it was a D3-focused Council, right? And many, uh, but but the commission committee on women is all of the uh, divisions, and so it was really an opportunity to work with colleagues from a variety of different kinds of institutions, public and private, and D one and D two and D three, and, and the committee also is not just presidents; it's uh, people from different areas of athletics or faculty, athletic representatives, and and it was really a holistic view of what, in this case, matters about opportunities, athletic opportunities for women on campuses and how we keep that strong. I was on the council uh, you know, during the time when we were discovering and encouraging the NCA to really do a deep self-reflective exercise and to bring in external expertise to look at, in particular, championships and mm -hmm. how uh, those can better serve women. And I've been really excited to see the follow-up. I'm no longer uh, able to be on the committee because I'm not a college president. I'm president of CIC, but I, I do follow the work and, and uh, uh, the Office of Inclusion and continue to be in awe, Naya, of the work you and your colleagues do there. Well, we we appreciate you and you always been a, a supporter and an advocate um, to push us as an association and as a department and provide the level um, of guidance um, and direction that I think makes intercollegiate athletics even better um, because of your voice and, and your perspective. So we, we really appreciate you and everybody in the Office of Inclusion says hi. Oh, <laughs> good. Way. Send them all my, my love. I visited them uh, uh, early on in my time here at CIC, I, I yes, Amy shared with me Amy catch did. up yeah. and yeah, so that yeah. was that was great. That's good. Um, I know that uh, you know when you, the first question that we asked and we talked about the remote and you know the pandemic and the impacts it has had on colleges and universities and another aspect um, that has faced us not only in higher education but as a community is racial injustices that have taken place and continue to take place in our country. And for me, diversity, equity, inclusion is and has been my life's work. And so it's exciting for me to engage with and I really value leaders like you who are intentional in terms of creating inclusive and strategic plans and initiatives that align with diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so I know that during your times at Rose in 2017, you made access and equity a college-wide priority. You appointed the college's first chief diversity officer and vice president for strategic initiatives. You increased diversity within your cabinet and the student body, and, and y'all did some incredible things during your time at Rose. So why was that important for you? And how do you encourage other leaders, particularly college presidents, to make equity and access a college-wide priority? It's such an important question and one that, you know, I think a lot about in this new role where I'm working with college presidents from across the country, all of us are wrestling with those issues that you brought up, right? And, and we're wrestling with them not simply because we think uh, it's a nice thing to do or out of a sense of um, compassion even. We're wrestling with them because they are foundational to the educational mission. Mm -hmm. 
right? If, if our mission is to help educate students to liberate minds, liberal arts college, we liberate. That's what the, where the liberal comes from, liberation. We liberate minds, we create tomorrow's leaders, we um, build institutions that will serve the needs of students. We have to be able to do that in, the, in a way that is, it meets the needs of the diverse students of today and the even more diverse students of tomorrow. And, and that, that has to begin, I think, with the top. I mean, we do, you know, institutions must have and should have chief diversity officers, but in many ways, it's the president that has to be the chief chief diversity officer mm -hmm. in the sense that if there isn't a real institutional commitment to grow, to change, to learn, to adapt, that change will not happen. Mm -hmm. And change making is a, essential to leadership, but people don't like, you know, people want change, they don't want anything to be different. Mm -hmm. And there's no way that you can truly say we're gonna transform institutions to, um, to, to, to be, where, where, where sort of diversity isn't just at the edges, but it's in the center of the institution mm -hmm. without making change for everyone. And it's hard work, it has to be committed work. It's work that has to be collaborative and collective. You know, as a, as a white woman who has broken barriers, I've been the first woman and the first Jewish person in, you know, that's been the headline of all four of my last jobs. But, you know, I can't, I can't think through issues around race and ethnicity and even religious identities without lots of input, lots of conversations. It has to be collaborative work, but it's work that has to be, has to be done. Um, I, I always think of, you know, this notion of belonging. I, I think every college president would say they want every student on their campus to feel that they belong at the center of the experience. My dream from the colleges I led was that every student would say, I'm at the center of this experience. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I can't say honestly that we were at a place where I felt we had reached that goal, but I did feel that we were aiming towards it and that it was a goal we needed to endlessly pursue. What does that mean at the center of the experience, able to experience everything or that uh, no. the experience is built around them? Or, I mean, how, 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 do you, how do you define that for our audience? That's a, that's a good question. So, no, I mean, most campuses offer more opportunities than any student could take advantage of. But every student should feel that those opp opportunities are available to them. And I think all of us know what it's like to come into a space that we feel is not really made with us in mind. Um, you know, again, as I said, I was the first Jewish president at the institutions I, I served, and uh, um, they both of those institutions were Presbyterian colleges. They had begun as the idea of Presbyterians. That's you breaking glass ceilings. Those are, I broke a lot of glass ceilings. Um, at Rhodes, they used to say I broke the stained glass ceiling. Uh, so, so um, um, you know, those were spaces, right, that they weren't invented thinking, oh, someday we'll have Jewish women here. Um, many of our institutions, independent institutions began at, uh, as single sex institutions or with a religious tradition or um, either explicitly or implicitly white institutions. So they weren't designed with me at mind, in mind. Do I, does that mean I always will feel forever that I'm on the edges? No, institutions can transform themselves so that I too can wake up and say, I feel at home here. I feel as though my full self is welcome here. And I don't remain just on the margins of the institution. I'm here at its center and at its core um, with just as much claim to being here as anyone else has. And that's a hard and heavy lift for institutions uh, that are making changes of a whole variety of types. Some are becoming co-ed, some are expanding the the ways they reach out to students from different economic backgrounds or from rural versus urban areas and how do you build a community how do you which to me is a microcosm of how do you build a country how do you build a community in which those kinds of differences are seen respected understood and yet still we stay at the table and we still try to to build a common experience with each other. It's hard work.
Hard work with needed work. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna keep going if you got more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just I love that that how you said it must be at the center of the experience and not on the margins. Um, and I, I think that's what you know we're seeing some of that shift happening on campuses. Some of the the anxiety we feel, I think, as a country, and it's certainly reflected on our college campus, is what it means when we say not just that someone is invited or welcomed in but that no, actually you are just as much a citizen, just as much a, um, a real member of this community as those of who see themselves as having greater claim to that space. It, it, it creates tension, it creates um, anxiety and how we find ways to navigate that will determine, I believe, the future of our institutions and the future of our nation. Let me slip in a question now, if you don't mind, and then you can take okay. back over, because I, you, you're talking about, you're talking about being first. And this, I said this was an episode of first, Margie. I don't know if I, how I teed you up for that, but um, a first female president at Rhodes, and and all the things that you've done. You've, and you've written, yep. Yeah, and you've written a book, yes. a leadership guide for women in higher education, yes. and this is an important topic for multiple reasons, because we, and I see we we I mean Elvin and I. Um, we have a audience that is 46% women. And so I don't know what other higher education podcasts, what their demos are, but I can't imagine that they have almost half of their audience women. So we've dedicated a day, for example, every Wednesday, we release uh, an episode where it's a woman leader in higher education. There are, there are weeks we have to work really hard to make sure we have enough women in the pipeline to release. Okay, so this is a common problem for us. Um, uh, uh, women of color um, is another complexity uh, to that. Do we, you know, we, we look at our guest list and we go, do we have enough black women? Do we have uh, Latina women that have represented? Do we have enough that represent higher ed? And we'll look at each other sometimes and go, no, we don't. I mean, we, we, we've got to go out and find uh, women, more women. And so well, you, you call, call Naya and I, and we will we'll give you lists of great women. Yes. To be on your well, it's funny because we've had previous guests and we'll say the same thing. We're like, okay, to give us your ac access to your women leaders. They send us the list. We go through the list. We exhaust the list and we have to do it again. Yeah. But it's just not right. as common. So what do, what right. do no, women leaders in higher ed need to know? Like what, how do you cr create a pipeline of women leadership that want to work in higher ed right. that is typically what male dominated, white male dominated? This is something I've clearly thought a lot about both because of my own personal career path, but also because of the mentoring work that I have done, uh, which culminated in this, this recent book that you very kindly uh, mentioned, uh, which was just out from Johns Hopkins University Press this summer. The book, the book really asks us to think about this. You know, if you were saying you were having trouble finding women students, even when black women students or women students of color, I would say then you clearly aren't paying attention because the majority of college students are women exactly. right now. And women, um, as we know, tend not only to enroll in greater numbers, complete in greater numbers, earn honors, higher grade point averages, et cetera. Um, men still have the advantage when they enter the world of work, though they earn more than women do on average. So uh, there's still plenty of work to do. But, you know, as we think about that diverse group of students, we, we then have to think about how that translates into faculty diversity and leadership diversity. Both of those things have been very important to me in my career. I think your question, I like the way you asked it, not just about how do we find support, develop, mentor that next generation of women, but how do we think about creating structures of work that will make that work satisfying for women? Um, and by women, I mean anybody who uh, has a family, that could be we 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 use women in the universal generic, so uh, I, 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 where where men can qualify as well, right? But how do you make leadership meaningful to people who want to make change, to people who uh, want to have a family and a life beyond their their work, and to people who um, you know have many other options? Uh, I, I think a lot about that, and one of CIC's missions is to help develop and support leadership in higher education. 
we we spend a lot of time and energy doing that at a variety of different ways and levels. It's part of what brought me to CIC because I believe in that so so wholeheartedly. Wow. Well, I'll pass it back to you, Naya. Fire. Fire. <laughs> Go ahead. It, it, it is fire. And I just ordered the last book on Amazon. Your last one in stock. They'll get more. They'll so get people more. People get more, right. So go out and get yours. So <laughs> you can get it for your, and you can, you can get it for your Kindle. So you're good. You're, yeah, the, yeah. You, you so I, I just ordered it in my cart Uh-oh. and i um, really excited to read it. And, you know, you talk about being the first in, in many of your roles and you're the first female president in the 65 year history um, of the CIC. And so thinking about your book that talks about the challenges that you know women face as they move into senior leadership roles within colleges and university um, what has been the thing that has stood out to you the most in terms of the challenges based upon your own experiences and hearing from other um, women in the field I think I, th- I think the challenges the, the challenges I think are both external and internal um, you know they're external in the sense that we still live in a society in which the people are asked to think of the generic leader, you know, imagine a a man in that role. And it's hard often to reconcile what are considered the sort of cultural norms of femininity, being nice and being caring and being um, group focused and relationship driven with what are sometimes seen as the generic traits of leadership being firm, being uh, focused on structure, uh, being able to separate and out your emotions. It, it, it can be hard to think how those things will be reconciled. Um, so th- there are certainly structures that most of the people doing the hiring of leaders are men. Uh, college presidents are typically hired by board, board you know, committees made up of board of trustee members who are um, you know, more likely to be men than not. And so, you know, that sense of does, does this person fit? Can we see them? Can we fo- see them as our leader? I think is still an issue for women. We still face barriers in that way. I think it's still true that women are often more likely to be hired on the basis of their accomplishments, whereas men sometimes get a pass and they're hired on the basis of their promise. I think women uh, sometimes are doing the job, are more likely to be doing the work without the title mm-hmm. than, than men are. Um, there still are pay gaps, there still are trust gaps, there still are confidence gaps. So um, I think do think women face particular barriers, but there are also uh, internal or family oriented barriers. So I work with women as a mentor and I, I find that women often think about, well, what will it mean to my family for me to take on a job that's really 24 seven or move my family across the country so that I can have this career opportunity? What will it mean uh, to have this shift in my identity from a role where I'm one of a team or one of a one of a group, I'm a, one of the faculty members, or I'm part of a department, to now suddenly being in charge of that group and and losing some of the friendships and relationships, or at least seeing those shift. Mm-hmm. So I, I think women have to grapple and wrestle with all of those things. What does it mean to be ambitious as a woman? How do you reconcile that with your other kinds of concerns? And, you know, we can debate, people can debate, are these nature or nurture? Are these culturally imposed? Is there something innate? I, I, I think it's largely irrelevant. The question really is given that, how do we do that? The most important thing that happens though, is that as women move into leadership roles, we're changing the nature of what we think leadership looks like. My hope is that, um, you know, every time a woman, you know, every time a woman leads an angel gets its wings, another woman looks and says, oh, I see a different way I could do that. And I think that's changing the way men lead as well. I think we're seeing a generation of men coming up through the ranks that are more likely to think in terms of win-win solutions and inclusive dialogues and making a space for work-life balance in the workplace because they've seen that modeled by the women leaders they know. 
Great. I, I'm going to use your book for my dissertation, too, because my dissertation is on the barriers that the women face, particularly uh, athletic directors. Um, so be very helpful. Yes, I talk about um, in part drawing on the experiences I I had uh, in, with the NCAA talking to diverse groups of women, many of whom had built a career in athletics of one sort or another. And I think one of the things that I, I learned there and with other women I've, I've mentored is that often women of color are really pitted against each other in the sense that, you know, they'll say, well, we, we already have a black woman in a leadership role, so we're done. And that sense that, you know, there isn't enough space for more than one of a type or of a kind or of a perceived kind, I guess I should say, Yikes. really can be a, a challenge and, and, is an added difficulty so that instead of fostering alliances, it can foster competition and women have to work very hard to build alliances around that structural undermining of those relationships. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing. And I'm going to pass it over to you, Joe, because I have more questions, but I, I, I'm a co-host. So I'm not. <laughs> well, no, I, you guys are doing, I, I don't mind just sitting down and putting my feet up and listening to the YouTube go. <laughs> um, if you want to keep going now, I want you to make sure you get all your questions from Marjorie. So please get to it or I'll take over either way. Well, let me ask one last question. So I, I think it's one last question, but I, I'll say it's one last question. So I, I love quotes and I love taking notes from mentors and other people that I admire, such as yourself. So I got some notes for today. Um, and I like to learn, you know, from uh, other people, particularly the women. So I know in the book, you talk about advice that you've received and you're giving some great advice to, to women and just to others about the women's experience. So what um, has been the latest and greatest advice that you've received? And, and it could be related to work, but it doesn't have to be related to work. That I've received. So what is yeah, some you. advice I've received? I too try to listen to advice uh, from, from leaders. Um, I think I, I, I was actually on a webinar yesterday with a, another colleague who's the president of a of a community college and she she talked about we were, we were talking about morale on campus and she talked about needing to really understand our present moment as living in a war-torn country and I thought that was such an interesting metaphor because it really speaks to sort of a level of sustained trauma over time and a, a, a real uncertainty about the future and a, an uncertainty about will and even should things return to normal. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a really thoughtful metaphor to use for this moment. Obviously, we could talk about ways that, you know, it doesn't match on to this moment. But I, I it, it was very helpful to me as I think about the work we're doing with presidents and other campus leaders to think about what it is like on the ground for faculty and staff and what their experience of the last 18 to 24 months has been and how we need to continue to provide support for them to do their work on behalf of students. Well, let me ask you a question on top of Nye's question because she's asking better questions. I can't have that. It's my, you know, I'm the... <laughs> Those are her pro, missiles. Right. She's just dropping <laughs> missiles on questions. Um, so what, here, here you go. What advice would you provide to us dudes um, who are managing um, sometimes a group of women leaders mm -hmm. to, to make sure that we are facilitating um, uh, uh, the proper growth of women leadership in higher ed and not oblivious to, you know, and I'm not sure how to ask it and I'm, I'm not tiptoeing, sure. but, no, I'm no, sure but I think it's good. And, you know what I mean? Yeah. And this is advice that I think it, the, the, the advice I would give you is very similar to the advice I, I would give to myself and to other white women about how to support women of color, right? Anytime you're trying to think about how you support people who in their leadership who are not like you or, you know, may face other barriers, I, I think it's really important to, first of all, be a good listener and to believe what they tell you. When they say, for example, I notice that my ideas don't get uptake in the meeting, or I notice that if I say something 
it doesn't get uptake until somebody else repeats it or, uh, you know, pay attention to that and try to find opportunities to encourage all voices to be present in the conversation. So I think all of us need, any of us who hold any kind of privileged position need to remember to do that over and over and over again. Um, I also uh, advise really trying to continue to do that work of self-reflection ourselves and to model it back in a non-defensive way, to be able to say, I recognize I come with a certain set of experiences. Those experiences often translate into assumptions and biases. I have things to learn about this. I'm trying to do this work. You can bring these things to my attention and I will do my very best not to react with defensiveness as my first go around, you know, or at least lick my defensive wounds in private, but try to really listen to what you want to generously teach me about this situation. Um, I think it's also important to, to uh, provide the same sort of collegial advice and informal advice that are, is sometimes just easier to provide to somebody that you feel you share a more personal bond with. I, I was listening to a, another podcast, not this podcast where this would never happen, oh, but another okay, podcast okay. where uh, recently were two, two academic men were talking about their experiences in graduate school. And they were talking about, you know, the grand times they had had befriending their faculty members and their academic advisors. And they used to hang out and go to movies together and all of these sorts of things. And that's lovely. But, you know, that's not necessarily the experience I could have had in graduate school where all my professors were male and the thought of, uh, you know, going out to a movie in the evening with one of my male professors would have had a very different connotation to others around us, even if there wasn't anything awkward between the two of us. So that's crazy. I got mine you know, online. I never even saw a professor. Well, you there know? you go. <laughs> so, but, but again, that's just an example, right, of thinking about the ways you're interacting with the people you work with and, and really trying to do your best to make sure that you're providing an equivalent level of support and informal mentoring and not just reserving that for the people that perhaps share a life experience or perspective with, as you do. Yeah, that's important. I, I'm, I'm glad you said that. because And I think making, yeah, oh no, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, no, you go. I was just gonna say, and let's not underestimate the importance of equal pay and uh, a, a fair and equivalent titles. Yeah, I think that all that's important in it. And, you know, one of the things that I find in the number of presidents that we've interviewed and higher ed leaders, that it's very easy to um, it's very easy to want to drift to one particular area. Like, oh yeah, we like talking to private college presidents or we like talking to community college presidents. Mm -hmm. It's it's because you go where you're comfortable. And so we've tried to go where we're uncomfortable. Right. Yeah. Let's talk to a bunch of people who who maybe community colleges are one area where you they, they haven't had as loud of a voice as uh, other college mm -hmm. presidents. So let's get 30, 40 of them on. Right. Um, so shifting the conversation just a little bit to the student side and presidents in dealing with uh, in your institutions, if you're dealing with primarily institutions that have what, between 1,500 and 3,000 students or so? Yeah, yeah. Those Ish. are, yeah, yeah for, for those that are thinking enrollment cliffs, that's what you would say the target uh, a student count is for institutions that might have a hard time coming out of coronavirus and moving into through the enrollment cliff. How are your institutions faring? How uh, discussed is the student enrollment cliffs? Are they losing students to coronavirus and re-engaging yeah. them and all of those things? Good, good question. So how is the sector doing of, yeah. of um, medium-sized and, uh, you know, liberal arts colleges or you independent ask the colleges, questions, right? but instead no, no, of me, a, that was good. It's a good question. Um, so a couple things, I think. One is there's a lot of variability and a lot of that has to do with uh, location, with um, the kind, how selective the institution is, with how large the endowment is. So we have institutions that have never been healthier and other institutions that are really struggling. Sometimes it's, you know, really because of those sort of location demographic um, mission structures more than really anything else. 
What I will say is that the institutions that I think are faring the best have a couple of things in common. One, they've been able to think very strategically. So we have some institutions that are intentionally getting smaller because they wanna be in a footprint that they can support with their endowment and not need to raise tuition, for example. There are other institutions that are intentionally and strategically growing in size so that they can better share the costs across a broader range of students. So that ability to think strategically with the end in mind and to look very, in a very focused way at your institutional strengths and how you can maximize those. Uh, just sort of briefly, I think of institutions in terms of a kind of three-part triangle. They're, they're built on their missions, their cultures, and their business models. And when those three things are in alignment, the institution will flourish. 100%. When they're out of alignment, Wait, that wasn't me for those listening at 100%. home. Who can't. <laughs> that, was your agree, that was the agree button with what you I, said. I like it. I like that agree button. Uh, so, so the job of the president and, and other leaders on campus is to help get those things in alignment. And institutions that have a path towards that, I think are doing well. Another thing I would say is that institutions that have created a foundation for meaningful and effective shared governance are doing well or better because they're able to bring more voices to the table. Uh, we, could, we could do a whole podcast on what shared governance is, how it differs in my view from faculty governance, how it can be healthy or unhealthy on a campus, but institutions where there is meaningful opportunity for people to know the facts about the institution, the understand its mission, its culture, and its business model, and discuss those with people from different constituencies and perspectives tend to be doing, I think, or t tend to be coming out of um, the the sort of latest crises in, in healthier shape. That's great. And you, the visual you provided, the strategic planning visual, right? Culture, business model, um, and which one am I forgetting? Mission, of mission. course, forgetting mission. Yes. Uh, if, if you use that as just a basic uh, basic diagram for creating a strategic yes. plan, that is one way to think about it. I love and, that. And thinking about them, and I, I, there's a chapter in the book on this, on uh, you know the how to think about this and what it means to lead. And, and to me, leadership is getting those things in alignment. And you know, part of the art of that work is deciding, so what, if they're not in alignment, what has to shift and how? And as Naya and I were talking about earlier, many, many institutions, you know, that the culture is not, needs to shift and change so that it is more inclusive and welcoming and fundamentally, at a fundamental level. And uh, how you do that and how you, you, you make sense of that you know, is, is part of the art of leadership. All right, Naya, you got a chance to slip in any last minute questions you have before I give Marjorie our final two questions of the episode. Okay, well, my final question is, what continues to sustain you um, as a leader in, in your leadership efforts? That's a very good question. You know, certainly the role of leading our, our higher education institutions is very hard. The pressures on college presidents are intense. And what sustains me, what sustained me in that work and what sustains me in my work at the Council of Independent Colleges as its president is a true and foundational belief in the transformative and transformational uh, promise of independent higher education. It is the great brilliance of the American higher education system that we have such diversity of institutions, of missions, of types of ways you can learn, of formats, of curricula, that's just brilliant. And then that we believe that education should be a lever for economic you know, growth, both of individuals, but equally important of communities, that really matters to me. I've always said that, you know, I measure the success of our institutions, not by what they do for individual students, but by what those students do for the world. And I just believe that in the deepest fiber of my being. I do believe that the future of democracy is in the hands of higher education. I do believe that the future prosperity 
of our country is in the hands of higher education and the work matters so much. Mm -hmm. So when I feel dispirited as a college president, I would look and talk and think about our students. As the president of the Council of Independent Colleges, I look and think and talk to our member presidents and provosts and other leaders. And I think, how can we help sustain you and make you more effective in this crucial work? Dare I say that's the mic drop moment of the episode. What if that was premature? What if I say something really good in answer to the last question? <laughs> that was only, I can hit right? the buttons more than once. Okay, good, good. We can have a light drop moment. <laughs> uh, so Margie, we ask each guest the same two questions uh, to close out our episodes. Number one, what did we miss about the Council of Independent Colleges that you want to say today? Something we forgot to ask you. It's Naya's first time. She, you know, sure. she probably forgot to ask you something. What was it? Um, anything you want to plug, website, anything at all? Yes, I, then, I certainly, go yeah, ahead. good. Please do go to our website. It's uh, cic.edu and uh, no, cic.org. Joellen, tell me which, which it is in the chat so I get it right. I can't plug it if I don't have it it's right. It's cic.edu. Edu, edu. thank you. Thank you, thank you. cic.edu. And uh, so please do check out our website and see the kinds of programs we have. Uh, your if your um, work or live at a, at a college that seems like it's right for our mission, we encourage you to get engaged. We, we are stronger when we act together. But I also want to give a plug for the, the incredible creativity and innovation that I am seeing on campus after campus after campus. I have to laugh every time I read about how colleges are unwilling to change or can't change or we don't. I mean, the, the change and the ability to problem solve, the ability to move from, from state to state is just unbelievable on our college and, uh, and university campuses right now. COVID really revealed that. And that innovation is unleashed and I think is really being put in the service of students across the country. So that's something I, I we didn't really get to talk about that, but it, I think it's very important and you can see that when you look at our members. And final, final question, Marjorie, what do you think the future of higher education is going to look like? I think one thing we'll see is a much better blend of face-to-face -face and remote instruction. Uh, too often remote instruction was touted in virtue only of its being cheaper and not necessarily of its being better. And that was uh, inhibited institutions, I think, from taking on some of its benefits and experimenting with it. The pandemic taught us the kinds of things that remote education is good for and good at and the kinds of problems it can solve. But it also really reaffirmed the irreplaceable benefit of face-to-face -face instruction and relationship-driven instruction. When you learn, eat, live, cheer for a team, um, watch a ballet a performance with the same people over time, you build on the learning in ways that it's impossible to replicate in a remote environment. And so there is an increasing demand for meaningful living and learning communities, uh, even from people who thought eh, residential colleges are going to go away and it's all going to be online because that's so convenient. Students are voting with their feet. They did not like it. They want to be on campuses. They want to be living with their uh, classmates. They um, e even adult learners want opportunities where they're interacting in real time and face to face with uh, with their with their fellow students. And so I think we will find ways to better blend those two things so that the strengths of each can be better realized. My greatest hope, my greatest hope and prayer, and I, I do believe that we will be headed this way because we must be headed this way, is that we will fully and truly support higher education as a society so that every student can find the institutional match that is right for them. And the quality of your education and the kind of education you receive is not a function of how wealthy your family is. Wow. That's, that's the big dream. Wow. And well, our institutions are working towards that every day. 
Well, I'll tell you guys, I don't know what you think about this podcast, but I think there's a darn good reason why we feel like we're the best podcast putting together these uh, amazing minds where I get to basically, I think part two of this podcast is just putting Naya and Marjorie together and then me just being on mute. That's, that's what I feel like part two is. Well, I enjoyed talking um, with both of you. I really love that you're doing this. I think, you know, the sort of free ranging nature of this podcast and the ways that you try to elicit meaningful conversation is really, really important. Um, a lot of the higher ed dialogue is very formulaic. You know what the claims are going to be before they're said. Mm -hmm. And you're really trying to create an environment where real thinking can happen in real time. And I appreciate that. So thanks. One of the things that thank you for that compliment. One of the things we find is the passion comes out when it's um, organic, yes. much, uh, much in a much more meaningful way. Uh, and speaking of passion, um, ladies and gentlemen, she's all fire, fire, fire. That's I did say fire. Her name is Naya Blair Hackworth. She's a future doctor, mm -hmm. Naya Blair Hackworth, and she's director of inclusion at the NCA. Naya, did you have a good time? here at the Edup Experience. It's amazing, better than my first time. I appreciate being a guest co-host and I appreciate Marjorie for you sharing so much wisdom and insight with us. Great to engage with you in this way. It was a pleasure. You've got a real talent in uh, broadcasting, I can tell. That's I thought so too, I think so too. When I interviewed her, I said, you gotta come be a guest co-host with me. And this will not be the only time, ladies and gentlemen, that you hear from Naya Blair Hackworth. She is coming back at least one more time. I got her back once more. I'm gonna give her an offer to come back more than once more if she wants to do it. She seems willing. So <laughs> please pressure her via her social media accounts and her LinkedIn account. Find her and tell her you want her back on the Edup Experience. Of course, our guest today, um, she's amazing. Here she is, Dr. Marjorie Haas. She's president of the Council of Independent Colleges, and she is one heck of a guest, and we appreciate everything you had to say. Please pick up her book. Um, it is called A Leadership Guide for Women in Higher Education by the Johns Hopkins University Press. Look it up. You will find it. I promise. Marjorie, absolute honor to have you on today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. You've just ed upped.